In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. The word of God for today is the gospel lesson that you just heard from the 12th chapter of John. I like to use this text because it is Palm Sunday. It's one of my favorites. And I just like it, that's all. I like this uh, passage. And I might add that John's gospel is the only one to mention that this event did in fact happen on a Sunday. And John is the only one who tells us that palm branches were used. We wouldn't know that without the Gospel of John. But with it we know about palms and we know about Sundays and there you are. We have Palm Sunday. Now in fact, a lot of churches have appointed readings that go through one year and then they start over and then do that same again for another year, another year, another, a one year cycle. But we actually use a cycle that covers three years. It's a so-called three year cycle. So year one is uh, series A, year two is series B, and can you tell me what year three is? <laughs> See, oh, you heard Pastor's secret now. <laughs> and uh, anyway, all three series, when it comes to Palm Sunday, all three of them use this story from John to cover Palm Sunday, not the other three. And this is interesting in and of itself. Uh, Palm, the Palm Sunday st story occurs in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that shows us that it's mighty important. And while I'm at it, let me ask you a somewhat of a trivia question. Can you tell me which miracle of Jesus is recorded in all four Gospels? Anybody? Oh, I'm not hearing much here. But. It is the, how many of you were going to say the feeding of the 5,000? Just raise your hand. <laughs> that was not it. Yeah, wasn't it? Well, yep, it is the feeding of the 5,000. And the fact that there are four recordings of it shows that that was important. And four accounts of Palm Sunday say that Palm Sunday is important. Now in our tradition, Palm Sunday uh, has often been a Sunday that was reserved for what? Confirmation, that's right, junior confirmation in particular. So let me just ask, I have a little poll here. How many of you were confirmed on Palm Sunday? Okay, several of you, including myself. For me, Palm Sunday was March 22nd, 1959. You remember that year well, don't you? <laughs> 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 Oh, you do. <laughs> you were a grandpa by then, weren't you? <laughs> wow. Yeah, but anyway, yes, uh, junior confirmation. So mine was in 1959. And do any of you remember your confirmation being on Palm Sunday? Yes, you do, okay. But how many... Uh, don't remember which Sunday you were confirmed on. How many of you don't remember? Okay. How many of you are just having trouble remembering anything? <laughs> that brought the most hands, including my own. Well, and then there is this uh, mystery of the donkey, and I, I like to, uh, how many stories just contain a donkey, at least in the New Testament? But what is it with this donkey? Now this story, you remember, it quotes the prophet Zechariah in the Old Testament hundreds of years before this. It's an Old Testament prophecy, and it's a prophecy of Palm Sunday, and it mentions two animals, the mother donkey, and her offspring colt. And now John quotes this verse, but he mentions only one animal, that's probably the colt. But I know what he, I think I know what he's getting at here. 
This is coming from an old Hebrew teacher, so just bear with me for a second. When it says, a colt and a donkey's colt, or a donkey and a donkey's colt, I should say, what the Hebrew often is saying is, a donkey, more specifically, namely, a donkey's colt. So how many animals would there actually be? One, One that's right. But then Mark says, <laughs> Mark says that, uh, that two animals were bought to Jesus, the donkey and her colt. So I'm wondering, well, well what's uh, with this anyway? Uh, are they preparing Jesus for uh, some circus routine, you know, where he can just ride both horses at the same time? But then Mark gives us the secret to all this. He mentions that the colt Jesus was to ride on had never been ridden on before by any human being. And it would be customary at the time if the colt was at all skittish about this kind of first time experience that the mother would accompany the colt as a calming influence so that the colt wouldn't freak out. And that's probably what happened. But remember the donkey for a later reference, which I'll get to in a minute. Now one peculiarity about John's account of Palm Sunday is it mentions Jesus, at least as part of this story, only one time. And that one time is when it says that uh, Jesus was sitting on the donkey, the young one. But that's it. That's all it's mentioned about him. And the rest of the story of Palm Sunday is focusing on the crowds that were reacting to Jesus and who he is and what he said and what he did. Now there are th three groups basically where we have the reaction. The first group actually came from Galilee, way to the north, and other points to the north. They were forming a caravan. Where have I heard that word uh, lately? <laughs> There's a caravan coming from, from Galilee and points north to Jerusalem to celebrate what? The Passover, that's right. And, uh, and it would have seemed that they were impressed with Jesus' miracles and the words he said, but they were really wowed the most by his miracles. In particular, they were wowed at Jesus raising Lazarus only a few days before Palm Sunday. It had just happened. And so it's almost like in a frenzy that you would see a National Enquirer. Not that I've ever read that magazine. But, you know, they wanted to see the miracle worker himself, and maybe they could see Lazarus himself, the one who used to be dead. He would be exhibit A of Jesus' power and his greatness. And yes, they did call Jesus king. And I think many of them, like we would, would mean that with all sincerity and its full meaning. But most of them thought of it as purely a statement of the, an earthly king. So some would say, uh, this new king that's coming, I know it's on a donkey, but he's coming, he, I can see it now, he's gonna come right into Jerusalem and go to Pilate's palace and say, well, you're just a puny uh, guy. Why do you deserve this palace anyway? And while I'm at it, you can tell your Roman buddies to get lost too because I am taking over. And as Jesus marched to the south with this caravan, the caravan seemed to grow and grow. And it finally reached ahead at Bethany. That's where he raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, Bethany is seven miles from Jerusalem, so you can bet that the Palm Sunday parade already started seven miles away from Jerusalem and kept going into uh, Jerusalem. But then there's the second group of observers. It was the Jewish leaders who were in Jerusalem itself. In particular, the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees were getting some bad news lately. They were, they saw that their power and their influence over people was gradually 
but almost imperceptibly slipping away. Their influence was weakening. It was eroding away. And this whole weakening process seemed to have started about the time that Jesus started his ministry. Oh, <laughs> surprise, surprise about that one, huh? But by the time of Palm Sunday, the cheers of the crowd for Jesus brought the Pharisees' insecurity to a head, to a frenzy. And they were even joined in their pity party by the chief priests. And they joined the Pharisees and they were outraged and they were jealous. They wanted to just plain kill Jesus. And while they had it, they wanted to kill Lazarus too. Did you know that? They wanted to kill Lazarus so he'd be dead again. But they were trying to get rid of the evidence. And they finally threw up their hands and said, what can we do? The world's just gone after him. The world is just going crazy. What are we supposed to do? So there was the first group, the people that traveled with him and listened to what he said and did. And then there was the second group, the Pharisees, and they were just all jealous. And finally, there was the third group of observers. This is more easy to identify. It was the disciples. Now let me make clear on something. After Jesus rose from the dead, and after the Holy Spirit came to them at Pentecost, they knew what Jesus was all about and they preached it to everybody and that's how the church started. And, uh, and thus, when they wrote about the story years later as enlightened disciples, they could see, well, that prophecy from Zechariah was actually, you know, it was about a donkey and a king. But you know what they were, he was talking about? He was talking about Palm Sunday, 600 years or so in advance. And uh, they were starting to realize, just like I realized years ago, and I think you do too, that every chapter of the Old Testament is about Jesus. The only one who counts for our salvation. Every chapter. That's why I came to teach the Old Testament. And that's the main message of Pentecost. Peter got up after the Spirit was poured down. And he quoted a whole series of Old Testament passages saying that it's all about Jesus. Jesus was the subject all along from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane and beyond. Now that was after Pentecost, but on Palm Sunday, before all was revealed to them, they had an idea about Jesus, but in some ways they were in the dark, like everybody else. And all the disciples could Billy do, do is run scared and hide and hope that nothing too bad happened to their master. So that's the scene on Palm Sunday. The hero worshipers who want an earthly king, the insanely jealous Jews, and a handful of his friends who, at least at the time, were lost in a fog. And then there was Jesus sitting on a donkey in the midst of all those thousands of people, all having different ideas and different reactions, and some sincere to be sure, but otherwise a real hodgepodge. And I have to say, do you know how lonely he had to be? Because he knows what he's gonna go through. He was the loneliest person in the world because nobody could really identify with him and his mission, which hadn't become clear to them yet. They, and all Jesus knew in the meantime as he rode over the palms and crunched them down, all he knew is that he was gonna do, he was gonna die. And he was gonna do so painfully. And he was gonna do so slowly and by inches. And he saw it a week in advance, not less than that. And he saw it so visibly, visibly and vividly that sometimes this would be his human nature to sort of panic once in a while when he thought about this. He'd have times where he just wanted two or three friends to be with him, just watch with them for a little bit. 
he was so upset by the, what was coming that he was even bleeding in advance, which is what he did in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was all alone, but he would go through it for our salvation. And you know what I think cheered him on? He, he knew what was in store for him, but then he heard all these hosannas, which mean, save us, Lord. And he said, <coughs> hearing thousands saying, save me, I'm sure that kept him going all the way to the cross. Now, I think of that donkey. I mentioned I'd bring him up a little bit later. Secular kings rode a horse, and they'd ride on some kind of a charger, would charge into the camp of the enemy and then kill as many people as possible. But Jesus is riding a donkey, a beast of burden, a humble creature, as the text suggests. An animal which would, by nature would wind up being a servant and would do its humble work without ever complaining. And uh, okay, the young donkey might panic a little bit with Jesus on his back, but Jesus in his human nature who was riding the donkey might have had all those same kind of panics as he rode along. But one last thing, Jesus went through a lot, and he went through a lot for you and me. And he bore a burden, all right. He bore a burden of our, of our sins and our shortcomings and our trials. He bore everything that's human about us, and he rescued us. And when you see Jesus going through all of this, as he hears the crowd saying, save us, you have to ask, what could you possibly say back to Jesus as he rides past you on the donkey? I said before, the, the group said it in some cases rather unwittingly. They said, it was in Hebrew, Hosea, which means save us, and Na, which means pretty please. So save us, please. That's what kept Jesus going. Now, Hosea, save us, and now, please, became one word, Hosanna. And Hosanna became just a general word of praise. It's like the word hallelujah, praise the Lord. And uh, in putting this together, here's what it comes out for us personally. The greatest word of praise that you could ever give to Jesus is the word of praise which says, save me please. That's a word of praise because when you're in trouble, when you're guilty and when you're sick and when you're on your deathbed, you praise him with all your heart and you praise him by saying, save me please, help me please. That kept him going. And that will keep you going, too. That little word of praise, save me, please, uh, that kept Jesus going and told him that he hadn't died in vain. Amen. We'll be confessing our...